If you're getting started off using C Sharp and working in .NET, without a doubt you've come across exceptions. And you've probably seen try-catch blocks that we can go implement to help handle exceptions. But I want to talk about the third part of the try-catch block, and that's the finally block. Hi, my name is Nick Cosentino, and I'm a Principal Software Engineering Manager at Microsoft. In this video, I want to walk you through the behavior and the reasons why we have a finally block associated with try-catch. So we'll be looking at try-catch finally with a couple of really basic scenarios, but I want to show you when the code and how the code runs when we have a finally block set up after catching those exceptions. A quick reminder to subscribe to the channel and to check that pinned comment for my courses on Dome Train. With that said, let's jump over to Visual Studio and check out Try Catch Finally. All right, on my screen, I just have a very basic example of what Try Catch Finally looks like, and I have a whole bunch of console write lines so we can see when this stuff executes. So I'm gonna go ahead and run this and I'm gonna pull it up beside all of the code. So we'll see that of course this code is not currently throwing an exception, but if I have both of these things together, let's zoom in a little bit here, we can see that we get the code running before the try catch finally. And then we have these two like line four and six, that output back to back because there's no other code running there. We don't get line 10 printed because there is no exception. And then the code inside of the finally block on line 14 is the last part to print to the console here. So very simple, pretty straightforward. And then we know if we go to throw an exception anywhere inside of this try portion of the, the try catch block, right? So anything between line four and seven, we know that we're going to hit this catch block as long as the exceptions met. And this filter that we have in the catch block is for any exception, right? So that or this, will catch any exception that is catchable inside of .NET. If you did not have the correct exception filter set up, so you were trying to catch a very specific exception, then of course we wouldn't see it happen. But if we threw an exception anywhere in here, we know the catch block will get hit. And the way that the finally block works is that it will run after the exceptions caught or in the happy path as well. So we already saw the happy path run we saw that the final output that we got was line 14. And that means if we wanted to have something like cleanup code, we can use a finally block to say, hey, look, like once we run the code up here, even if it's successful, we want to do it and run this code down here. Or if it throws an exception and we catch it, we still want to run the finally block. So to kind of prove that happening, I'm gonna throw an exception between these two lines. And so when I go to throw this exception here, you can see line six, it's actually grayed out inside of Visual Studio. It knows that it's unreachable code. But what we should see now is line one, line four get printed out. Then we'll get the catch block. And then we will still get this finally block printed, right? So the new line that we see coming up here is this is in the catch block. So again, this isn't super exciting, but this is the basic behavior of the finally block. It runs code after your happy path succeeds. So once all of this code runs, or if you throw an exception anywhere up here, and it's met by this catch block, we will go run the finally block. Now, there's a bit of a nuance to what I'm saying as well, because I said, if it's caught by this catch block, and we're gonna see in a little bit just what that means, because sometimes the finally block will run and other times it won't. And you might be asking yourself, well, how the heck can the finally block not run, right? Isn't that the whole point of having the finally block? Well, I wanna show you a simple example coming up in just a moment where that doesn't work. Okay, so the next example that we're going to look at is a really common pattern that happens, and it's often one of the reasons we have this concept of a finally block. It's because we want to have some type of cleanup work that happens after we go run some code. Now, I'm going to show you using what's called an iDisposable object. So down here, you can see that I have a new class called my resource. It implements this interface, which has one method on it called dispose. By the way, this is built in if you haven't used it before. I'm just going to write to the console that we've called this method. Now, we're going to look at some more advanced things that we can do with this class after, but this is just to illustrate the pattern. So you'll notice a very similar setup to what I just had, right? I'm going to make the resource outside of the try catch block. And the reason for doing that is that I want to, on line 30, try to do the cleanup code. Now, if I didn't have it declared outside of that, right, if I put it inside here, we can't actually access resource because the scope of it is limited to line 19 through 23. 
it's just not in scope for us to access inside of the final block. So it makes it a little bit awkward, in my opinion, to have to do it outside of the try-catch finally, just to access it here. But this is how you would go about this. Now, the way that this works, again, we're going to talk about the happy path first, is that we can have a right line before the try-catch finally. I'm not going to throw an exception. And then I wanted to show you that we can go dispose of that after. So we should see this line and then the dispose line get printed because that's being called inside of the finally block. And again, not super exciting, but we see these two lines printed one after the other. So the finally block is doing what we would have expected in this case, very much like the first example, right? So I'm going to go ahead and show you that if we go throw an exception now, that we still get that behavior that we want. So it will be very much like the very first example that we saw inside of this, but this is before the try catch finally, this is in the catch block, and then the dispose method, right, this line here, is called from line 30. So this is really how you can set up cleaning things up. I did say that I wanted to show you an example of where this finally block will not run though. And here's a bit of an interesting one. So if we throw an exception, so this is a base exception type. If I put invalid operation exception right here, so now we're trying to catch a specific example, you would think that what should happen with a try catch finally is that we throw the exception here, it does not get caught, but we still have to go run this finally block, right? Well, let's go see. In this case, you can see that it hit this line throwing an exception, right? There's nothing to catch the specific exception. When I press F5 to continue the program, you can see that we never got to see the dispose method getting called, right? It says this is before the try catch. Then we see the unhandled exception, but there's no code that actually runs the dispose method. So this is one particular example where that's not happening, right? The dispose method or anything inside of the finally block is not getting called. The reason that that's happening is because the program itself is terminating. It's kind of weird because I'm going to show you in just a moment how you could air quotes fix this and make the finally block run, but it changes the behavior of the program. So if I put a try here around the whole thing, <laughs> so it's a big try catch around the other try catch, and then I use this to catch all exceptions. If I go run this now, what happens is that this prevents the program from crashing. This is a catch all. It's the same as doing this, right? If that's more comfortable for you to read. It means that this won't catch the exception. This one will, but the finally block will actually go run in this case, which I find pretty fascinating. So if we look here, we do see that we call dispose, right? That actually worked. Um, and maybe we can put in some other console write lines to see the order of things. Because the reason, again, that I find this interesting is that the finally block should go run right after the catch, but because the program was terminating before, it never did. Now that we can save it from terminating, it will go run the finally block. So this is not being caught there. I'm going to say this is in the catch block two, so we can see the outer catch block. Maybe I'll call it outer catch block just to make it a little bit more obvious. So this works as we expect, right? This is before the try catch. This is disposing of the resource in the finally block. And then of course, this catch is handled outside. So I think it's pretty cool that, or maybe interesting and not cool, that finally, that finally block that we saw, it will run only if the program is not about to terminate. For the most part, you might be like, well, yeah, Nick, that's totally fine. The program's already, you know, about to blow up. I don't care if I go, you know, dispose of something. But it depends what you're doing inside of your dispose method, where you might say, I really need to guarantee, even if my program is terminating, that I try to clean up as best as possible. It's a bit of an edge case, I would say, but I wanted to illustrate to you that there is a slight difference in the behavior of the finally block if your program's terminating or not. It might not ever impact you, just wanted to call it out. Okay, so we have the try catch finally block, and we were looking at finally being used to help clean things up. Now, it wouldn't be fair if I left out the details of what disposable is and how we can work around having a finally block. 
So instead of having the try catch finally block set up just so that we can do some type of cleanup like calling dispose on our object, instead we can use what's called the using pattern. And we have a using block as you can see here on line 35. And this is a keyword that only works with iDisposable implementations. So if I take this off, even though it still has a dispose method, you can see line 35 is now complaining. And it says that the type used in the using statement must be implicitly convertible to system I disposable. So it needs to have this interface that's built in to be used like this. The way that this works is it's very much like having a finally block to go run some things to clean up. So I'm going to go press play. Right, there's no exception being thrown in this case. So we can see that this is before the using block. Then we get the line right inside of the using block right here. Then disposing the resource, you might say, well, where is that happening? Well, as soon as we leave the using block, so once we leave line 41 and exit the using block, that's going to call dispose, which is going to print this line 55 here. And then after we see the line printed for this is after the using block. It's a really nice way to clean this kind of code up. But how does it work when we're throwing exceptions, right? That's what we were trying to deal with before. So let's go throw an exception and see what happens. Well, you might see something kind of funny here. This might look familiar, right? We throw an exception, nothing's catching it. If I go check the output, did we get to see the using statement terminate and get the dispose method called? And the answer is no. So we got these two lines printed, but just like earlier, when there was nothing to catch the exception the program was ending, it did in fact not get a chance to run the dispose method. If the exception is not going to terminate the whole program, you should get the behavior you expect. So let me go ahead. I'm going to put a try. Holy, that is way too much in front of my screen. <laughs> right, so I'm going to do this. I'm going to catch everything once again. So when we go to do this, I'm going to put um, that it's in the outer catch block. Oh, there's only one catch block, sorry. So we have the using statement and then this catch block outside. I want to show you that the dispose method will get called still before this outer catch block. And it's really because the program's not terminating, right? So. We can see now that the using statement does what we expect when we leave and we get to line 43 now once we go over that it will call the dispose method and the program's not terminating obviously because there's a catch block on the outside of the whole thing so if your program's not terminating your using statement should do exactly what you expect and dispose of the object once it's leaving now i want to show you the very simple version that we have of this available to us in dotnet so we went from having try catch finally to having a using block to just having this simple expression with using out the front. This is not to be confused with the top level import statements where you're saying like using some namespace. This is in fact just like the using block, but it's implicit. You'll notice that I don't have curly braces. It's not the same as doing this, which is probably a little bit confusing because this will only treat one line below it when there's no curly braces. So it is different when you do this. And the way that this works as a using statement is that once the variable, in this case, resource three, once that goes out of scope, that's when the dispose method is going to be called. So it's implicit because the explicit version must have waited until we hit the end curly brace. This just says once the variable goes outside of scope, then we'll call dispose. Again, it only works on iDisposable, just like the last example. But I don't need to go run this and show you the behavior of it again, because it is identical to how the using block worked. We just don't need to have the curly braces and the parentheses around this. There are situations where you might say, I just need to use this variable inside of the scope that I'm working in. So say it's in a given method. And there's other situations where you want to have a lot more granular control and you do want to have a using block and before your method ends or something, you want to call dispose before you keep continuing. So different use cases, but this is an implicit using. And I just wanted to mention tying it all back together that try catch finally, that finally block is often used to try and clean this kind of stuff up.
Now, all of this is because we have to deal with exceptions inside of C-sharp. And unfortunately, there's going to be code that we're using and leveraging that's outside of our control. And someone wrote that code that's going to be throwing exceptions. And of course, there always will be exceptional cases. But if you're curious about dealing with code that doesn't have exceptional cases and you want to move away from using exceptions to try and indicate error state, you can go ahead and watch this video next for some ideas. Thanks, and I'll see you next time.